Hello, so I return today to the subject of famous English misers, those who may well have been an influence on Charles Dickens in the creation of some of his miserly characters. And today I want to tell you about a famous London miser, Thomas Cabbage Cook of Islington, a man who died in 1811 and was well known for his curious behaviour in his lifetime. He was the subject of a short biography published in 1813 and his life has also been recorded in various works on English eccentrics. Before I get on to Thomas Cook's life, just to quickly mention that there are still copies of December's issue of the Antiquary magazine available. There are articles on Christmas traditions and an article all about two misers, an uncle and nephew who, though they were misers, were not quite as bad as Thomas Cook. You can get copies from the website and set up a subscription. And thanks to everybody who's supported this endeavour over the last few months. It's so much fun to be able to produce this publication for you all. Thomas Cook was probably born in 1725 or 1726, either in Geist in Norfolk or Clewer in Berkshire. No one is really quite sure. What we do know is that he was born in abject poverty and he was orphaned early. His father was an itinerant fiddler who lived hand to mouth, travelling and making music. And when his father died, Thomas was sent to live with his grandmother near Norwich. He had little or no early education and like many poor boys, he was sent to work as a child. And his first employment was in a factory near Norwich. It was a factory employing lots of boys who were pooling their meagre resources in order to feed themselves a better diet. Now, Thomas, even from this point in his life, considered himself to be somewhat different than his peers and destined for other things. And he didn't join in with this economy measure. Instead, eating a penny loaf and an apple a day, keeping himself to himself and saving what money he could, so that he could pay the boy Usher at a nearby village school to teach him to read, write and to do basic arithmetic. He realised at this stage in his life that education and using his natural cunning, intelligent and wit would be his way out of poverty. After this initial employment, he then went to work as a porter for a Mr Postle, who had a paper mill near Norwich, and he was an industrious and hard-working employee, and was soon given the opportunity to apprentice as a paper maker, so that by his mid-twenties, he had a good, solid trade. Now, the paper making trade was competitive in this period, and there were many people cheating the excise, the tax system, and Cook, a bright lad, became aware of the great advantages and money to be had by being an excise man and taking bribes. So Mr Postle helped him get a position uh, as an excise man in London and he moved to the metropolis. Now arriving in London, uh, for a time Thomas Cook was employed by a sugar merchant while he waited to receive his formal appointment to the excise, but in due time that appointment came and armed with a pistol and a cutlass, he began his work. And his first posting was a fortuitous one, for he was employed to inspect the trade of a paper mill in Tottenham. So he was quite at home knowing that business inside and out already. Now this is where Thomas Cook's use of his natural intelligence turns rather nasty. For the owner of the paper mill died during the middle of his inspection. But the widow of the mill owner, with the help of her relatives, was determined to carry on the business. And Cook saw this as an opening and opportunity for himself. He made it his business to find out precisely how much the widow was worth. He bided his time a few months and then put a plan into action. And it was a nasty and avaricious plan. He told the widow that she had been committing fraud and that the penalties that were now owed to His Majesty's customs and excise were double the value of all her property. It was, of course, a lie. That all she had to look forward to now 
was a court case, prison and abject penury. Of course this was all a ruse, but it did the trick. Petrified, the widow asked Cook what she should do, and his solution was that she married him, and then all her problems would go away, as he wouldn't report his findings. Now, as soon as the ink was dry on the marriage register, Thomas Cook had complete control of all her property and the mill. So he had gone from being a porter to a mill owner and a wealthy man in a matter of months. With the new wealth he had acquired through this marriage, and remember that married women owned absolutely nothing in the 18th century, he decided to enter into the sugar trade, buying a sugar making business at Puddle Dock near Blackfriars. But after a year running the sugar house, he found he'd made a £500 loss. Of course he made a loss. He was a young man with absolutely no experience in this trade. But he was quick-witted and he was good with words. He could be sociable if it had a practical purpose and he knew how to butter up people and he used that skill to gain the knowledge that he lacked. So he frequently invited young sugar makers to his home. He got them drunk, fed them well and then quiz them on the secrets of the trade, or as he referred to it, he sucked their brains for information. And no expense was spared if he felt he could therefore obtain some business advantage. And in the end, Thomas Cook did very well in the sugar trade indeed, making an awful lot of money, about £100,000, so much money that he was able to withdraw quite comfortably from trade entirely and retire. And he retired to a house in Winchester Place, what is now 64 Pentonville Road, the site of a hotel, later moving round the corner to White Lion Street. And he remained in Pentonville and Islington for the rest of his days. Despite having vast wealth by any standard, he was particularly penny-pinching when it came to providing well for his own wife and his household. He would buy very little meat, often when it was close to putrefaction, and he bought in only a very limited ration of beer for his wife and the servants, which he kept under lock and key to stop the maids and his wife guzzling it. The majority of his household sustenance was provided by cabbages, that Thomas grew himself. Now, Thomas Cook wasn't fond of flowers and dug up the whole of his garden in Winchester Place and planted it up with cabbages. Most of the manure was provided free of charge by the horses that were riding up and down the busy city road in Islington, which was just around the corner from where he lived. And he would often be seen in the middle of a moonlit night out with a bucket and spade collecting horse manure. When this was in short supply, he used to avail himself of a different sort of manure, procurable, says his biography, from a source nearer to home. And apparently he was often seen by his neighbours, who, whose properties overlooked his garden, and squatting over his cabbages and uh, manuring them in person. For this bizarre cabbage obsession and really quite peculiar behaviour, he became known to his neighbours as Cabbage Cook. Well, though this vision of this man squatting and defecating on his own cabbages is amusing, there's also a dark side to all of this too. Although her husband was wealthy, mostly due to the inheritance she had brought him, Mrs Cook had to enjoy years and years of living in poverty and misery. That coupled with the daily diet of cabbages, it is no surprise that she had cause to regret the marriage she had been conned into. This poor woman was so badly treated by Thomas Cook that it is said that she died of a broken heart, but it has been suggested too that she died of starvation. And Cook doesn't seem to care. As soon as his wife died, 
he was on the hunt for another wealthy widow, but thankfully this time without any success. Although Mrs Cook ached badly, her husband seldom did. But then he had a particular and very successful method of eating well without spending his own money doing so. And he made a fine art out of sponging from others. He would walk down a street of very fine houses and he would choose the finest and largest of them and then he would do one of two things. He would either pretend to fall over to attract the footman's attention or he would knock on the door claiming that he was feeling ill and ask for admittance in order just to sit down for a moment. He always ensured that he was well dressed, not because he liked clothes, but because decent clothing was part of this charade. Now the owner of one of these houses, seeing a well dressed gentleman in front of him in seeming distress, would have no hesitation in letting him in for rest. He would then be offered a glass of reviving wine, as was common at the time, but Cook would then refuse, saying he only drank water. He would then accept the wine when pressed, and would then flatter his erstwhile host on the wine's quality. Like many confidence tricksters, he had a way with words, and having flattered, he would then leave. A couple of days later, he would then return, making sure to return just at dinner time, ostensibly, or so it seemed to his host, to thank the host for his kindness. Of course, the host, being hospitable, would offer him dinner, which again, Cook would refuse, saying that his gruel was waiting for him at home. But when pressed again, he would then accept. By this time, the host had usually heard on the grapevine who his visitor was and how wealthy he was. And at that point, Mr Cook starts the real work. He sees the family's children and he begins to work on the woman of the house, flattering her on her offspring. Then he would ask them for the names of their children in writing before taking his leave at the end of the evening. Now, the host and his wife would then quite naturally begin to wonder why Mr Cook wants the children's name in writing. And in the course of a, a few months, as he got to know the family, Cook begins to intimate that the children will be his primary beneficiaries in his will. So these people, in an attempt to further ingratiate themselves with Cook on behalf of their children's interests, begin to lavish gifts on him, particularly sending him gifts of food. None of this food was eaten by Cook's wife or his own household. It was all sold. Cook was the sort of man who would prefer to have cash in his pocket than feed his wife and household. Now, Cook was not above creating counterfeit wills to keep this particular game going for as long as possible. Of course, it was all a con. He had no intention whatsoever of leaving his money to any of these children. And it is said that he duped over 20 families in this manner in a pursuit of a free dinner and cash in his pocket. As he got older and sicker, Thomas Cook had to find medical treatment, but his policy was that he would only pay the physician if he were cured of a particular illness. Now, even on his deathbed, Cabbage Cook was a penny-pinching old skinflint. He was determined that he was going to get a bargain with his coffin before he died, and he summoned Mr Bodkin, the Islington undertaker, to his house. The price Cabbage Cook offered for his coffin was less than the cost of the meanest common parish coffin for a pauper's funeral, so the negotiations were not completed. In the end, his executors gave him a funeral that was rather more lavish than he would have approved of. On the day of Cabbage Cook's funeral, in a wonderful example of real poetic justice, the local women of Islington and Pentonville brought to the graveside at St Mary's in Islington rotten cabbage stalks, and as his body was lowered into the grave, they threw them on top of his coffin, 
Some of them were heard to say that as he was so fond of cabbage in his life, he should have some to take with him to the other world. Cook was seemingly an unpleasant man. Every word of kindness and flattery that came from his mouth was calculated and was uttered with nothing but grasping intention. He was clearly a man of great abilities, intelligence, he was quick-witted and a good man of business, and had he used those abilities to the full in his lifetime, he could have changed the world for the better, to the praise of all. What is surprising, given how this odious, penny-pinching man lived his life, is the extraordinary and seemingly uncharacteristic way he disposed of his fortune, a fortune of £127,000 invested in the 3%. There is, bizarrely, a glimmer that this man had a conscience, for he leaves money to many people, some to former associates and relatives, some to children to support their education. His own experience of the value of hard-won education in his youth may account for that. What is even more surprising is that he left a large proportion of his wealth to assist the poor. He left £5,900 to the Fishmongers Company to support the 34 arms people in their care. 2100 to the parish of St Leonard Shoreditch to support poor widows. There are further similar bequests to numerous charities in London and Norwich for almshouses and for hospitals. And his charitable giving in his will is an extraordinary £30,000, a huge sum of money in the early 19th century. The will is detailed. It would have taken some consideration and forethought, which might suggest that Cook in his last months and years, was in heart and mind repentant for his miserly life. This man Cook virtually starved his own wife to death, but he prevented many other people from starving and perishing. And in death, he was among the greatest philanthropists in late Georgian London. Now, all of us are a mixture of good and bad. And few people are wholly depraved, Thomas Cook among them. Which does beg the question, what was the real motivation for his con-man behaviour and his penny-pinching ways? Was it due to a real fear of returning to the poverty of his youth? We'll never know. Thanks very much for watching.